I'm Walter Isaacson of the Aspen Institute, and we're here with the second of our lessons about the Reconstruction Amendments. I'm with Jeffrey Rosen, the CEO of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. And Jeffrey, now let's get on to the 14th Amendment, but first let's put it on our timeline. When did Congress pass it and when did the 14th get ratified? Congress passed the 14th Amendment on June 13th, 1866, and it was ratified on July 9th, 1868. And it's viewed by some as the most important amendment of the Constitution. Why? Because it contains our basic guarantees of equality and due process of law. The entire Civil War was fought to constitutionalize equality. It wasn't until the North won at Appomattox that that vision was embraced by Lincoln, and finally it was embedded in the 14th Amendment. Well, what was Lincoln's theory of constitutional equality? You know, it was quite powerful. There were some radical Reconstruction Republicans, Lincoln was not one of them, who thought that slavery was illegal even in the original Constitution, and basically that the so-called Privileges or Immunities Clause of the original Constitution forbade states to deny African Americans basic civil rights. But that wasn't the majority view. Lincoln's view was that it would require a constitutional amendment to overturn the Dred Scott decision, which didn't recognize African Americans as uh, having any legal rights, and to constitutionalize equality. And that's why the core of the 14th Amendment is Section 1, which basically extends to African Americans the same civil rights that white people had taken for granted. Well, let's read some of that, especially the Privileges and Immunities Clause. Read it to us here. What's important there? So the second sentence of Section 1 of the 14th Amendment says, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the law. And those three clauses, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, the Equal Protection Clause, and the Due Process Clause, are arguably the heart of the American Constitution. And what really seems important is the very first two words, which is no state. Because when we were talking about the Constitution, it says Congress shall pass no laws. Suddenly, it's the Constitution telling the states what they can do. That is absolutely right. You know, James Madison introduced an amendment that he considered the most important in his original list that would have prohibited states, as well as the federal government, from abridging basic civil liberties like free speech and religious freedom. But that amendment was rejected, and Madison thought that was a terrible mistake. It took the 14th Amendment, proposed by John Bingham, who was the James Madison of Reconstruction, to bind the states from abridging basic civil rights in the same way that the original Bill of Rights had bound the federal government. And Bingham said that he took those words, no state shall, from an opinion by John Marshall, Baron in Baltimore, which said if the original framers had wanted to restrain the states, they would have said no state shall. Bingham said that's exactly what I was trying to do. But didn't it take a while for the Supreme Court to interpret the 14th Amendment to affect the states that way? It absolutely did. It wasn't until the 1920s that the Supreme Court began incorporating basic rights like the First Amendment against the states, and that process really wasn't completed until the 1960s. So it was almost a century after the 14th Amendment was passed that John Bingham's original intention, namely to bind the states as well as the federal government, was finally vindicated. Did all of the framers of that 14th Amendment and all who voted for it, did they all intend to force the states to respect the Bill of Rights? Probably not. There was a lot of disagreement about what the 14th Amendment was trying to do. Uh, and of course, since the amendment was ratified at gunpoint, basically the southern states were told, you can't come back to the Union unless you ratify this amendment. Those legislators probably didn't agree that they would be bound in this way. The remarkable thing is that the Supreme Court eviscerated the amendment and essentially, ignoring John Bingham's original intention, read it out of the Constitution. And it got re read back into the Constitution in the 20s, is what you're saying. It did, but through a different clause, and this may Which sound clause? legalistic. John Bingham had intended that first clause, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, to incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states, but the Supreme Court, in a famous or infamous case called the Slaughterhouse Decision, read the Privileges or Immunities Clause out of the Constitution and basically said it didn't mean anything at all. It was the Due Process Clause that the Supreme Court began to use to incorporate the Bill of Rights against the states, and that's the one that has been used today. The problem is, uh, much of our current constitutional controversies arise over what the meaning of due process is and some of the most controversial decisions of the 20th century, from those recognizing economic liberties to reproductive freedom, have been read in through the liberty part of the due process clause. But the main linchpin I think we should focus on, right, is that for the first time, all of these rights, whether it was equal protection of the laws or due process or whatever, applies to every state, not just to the laws that Congress passes. 
That's exactly right. You know, the first words of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law, just binds Congress. But most of the infringements of rights took place at the state level. They were the ones that passed these black codes. They were the ones who denied African Americans the right to vote and rights of free speech. So that's why most constitutional litigation only began after the 14th Amendment began to apply the Bill of Rights against And so we can say that both the Civil War and the 14th Amendment is what made us one national country as opposed to a collection of federation of states. That's beautifully said. There was a debate at the time of the original framing about who shall be sovereign, the people of each state or the people of the United States. And James Wilson and uh, other framers believed it was the people of the United States, but it took the Civil War to make that a reality, and then it took the 14th Amendment to write that vision into the Constitution. And a living Constitution that took through the uh, 1920s and even to, the, to this day to apply it. That's true, although there's a big debate about whether you know the Constitution is supposed to be living or interpreted as originally intended. I think nowadays most liberals and conservatives agree that the 14th Amendment originally intended to apply the Bill of Rights against the states. Thank you, and next lesson, we'll wrap it up with the 15th Amendment.